you use the Q&A facility. So what's the topic? Why are we here? NBS. What is that? Is it a bank? An insurance company? A boy band? Because let's face it, how many of our friends and families outside this Zoom call would recognize that acronym NBS? And as a journalist, I wouldn't dream of using that term because I'm not even confident that many readers, uh, viewers, listeners would even recognize the three words, nature-based solutions. And we need to change that urgently if nature-based solutions are to provide the answers to climate change and biodiversity loss that we are so desperately searching for. Can we get to the point where as many people have heard about the solution as the problem? Can nature-based solutions enter our everyday vocabulary in the same way climate change has, or nature crisis, or even net zero? The European Union sees NBS as crucial to achieving at no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050 as part of its Green Deal and decoupling economic growth from the exploitation of natural resources. In short, Europe is pinning our future salvation on nature-based solutions, and it offers this definition. Solutions, and I quote, solutions that are inspired and supported by nature, which are cost-effective, simultaneously provide environmental, social, and economic benefits and help build resilience. Such solutions bring more and more diverse nature and natural features and processes into cities, landscapes, and seascapes through locally adapted, resource efficient, and systemic interventions. Now, I don't know about you, but that leaves me with a lot more questions than answers. And we truly hope to answer some of those questions today. Network Nature is, is hosting this event to help groups come together, whether it's people who are already working in the field of nature-based solutions or those who are completely new to it. It's about providing a platform for us to share knowledge and really make an impact. So to help us focus our minds, we have a theme today, ecosystem restoration. And the big question really is, do we do that passively by stepping back to allow natural regeneration of overexploited ecosystems? Or do we do it actively by stepping in to support ecological restoration? How can nature-based solutions help us restore habitats and bring back the biodiversity that has been declining at such an alarming rate? And it really is an alarming rate. When I was at the um, IUCN World Congress in Marseille last month, I saw a very simple statistic written on the wall uh, saying that global wildlife populations have declined by two thirds in just 50 years. Now, I know that simplifies a very complex set of data, but whichever way you look at it, the direction of travel for nature is downwards. And it utterly terrified me. And if you're looking for a reason to be here today, surely look no further than that. So now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Bettina Wilk from ICLEI. That's the organization that brings together local and regional governments committed to sustainable urban development. She's also a coordinator of Network Nature, so that makes her ideally placed to give us an overview of the objectives of today's event. So handing over to you, Bettina. Thanks a lot, Anna. Um... A very good morning to everyone and uh, welcome to this first edition of Network Nature's annual events uh, today here. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And I'm especially thrilled actually to have you joining in such large numbers. I've heard that we had like over 300 registrations um, and that there were more to come in actually after registrations closed. So that's uh, really a good sign and good to see. Um, Today, this is the first edition of a series of three annual events, actually, events that are envisaged to enhance the dialogue and also exchange, as Anna already pointed out. So the focus is really on um, valid and um, discussions among the NBS community, but also with uh, European policymakers and with experts and practitioners across the different sectors that should or already already have a say when it comes to nature based solutions. 
Network Nature's main aim is to support and consolidate uh, the NBS project portfolio and the NBS community, how we call it. On the one hand, by uh, collating and strengthening the knowledge and evidence base on Nature Based Solutions. And we do that through our online platform where we collect and gather the different resources, services, tools, and outcomes from the NBS project portfolio and beyond. But let us not forget that another objective that is as important is also that we have to disseminate and also promote this knowledge to a wider target audience. And here, I especially refer to these sectors and fields that are not yet so included in uh, the NBS discussions and in the dialogue. So in that sense, the annual event really works as a forum to start, initiate and strengthen this dialogue and exchange with representatives of these sectors, discuss with them what the potential entry points are for consideration and adoption of nature-based solutions in their field, and also make them aware and familiar with what we already know and what we can offer in terms of services and resources that have been so tirelessly compiled by the NBS project portfolio. As you will see, we have uh, compiled a quite varied program today. We have invited a broad range of panelists, speakers and attendees to do exactly that, ranging from landowners, infrastructure planners, but also landscape architects up to the finance and investment sector. Since actually our ultimate goal is to increase adoption of NBS across business science policy and practice. And this is exactly what we want to initiate and to do also through these annual events. Each event actually has a different uh, focus and theme that is co-determined also by the NBS community. This year's theme, as Anna has already introduced, is ecosystem restoration through nature-based solutions. So we basically look at how uh, can we make sure that nature-based solutions and through them uh, we can help achieve the targets and objectives of the European Green Deal. And how can we actually make integrated action work on the ground to fulfill on these targets? Because actually it's ultimately up to the local level to do exactly that. So I would like to thank uh, IUCN Europe and IUCN Global specifically for the development of this excellent program today, as well as the Network Nature Partners for designing the parallel sessions in the afternoon that leave ample opportunity for discussion and exchange. And I would especially like to thank the NBS community and the projects for joining us today here and in this dialogue, as well as throughout the duration of Network Nature. Special thanks also go out to our project advisor, Adria, and her colleagues, as well as uh, the colleagues from DGRTD for their continuous support and also for making all of this possible. So I wish all of you actually a fruitful and insightful meeting today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bettina. That's great. Um, so let's hear a little bit more now about Network Nature's ambitions for nature-based solutions. Uh, we're joined by two experts from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, to share some fascinating insights fresh from the World Conservation Congress. So we've got Chantal Van Ham, who is Acting Director at the European Regional Office, and also Daisy Hessenberg, Nature-Based Solutions Programme Officer. Over to you guys. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all today. Uh, as uh, you have heard, IUCN is one of the partners in Network Nature, and my colleague Daisy and I and the IUCN experts across our global organization are pleased to share with you some insights in our actions to optimize the uptake and implementation of nature-based solutions. Uh, as we all know, uh, the protection and restoration of the health of our ecosystems is the most important mission of this century. And uh, with regards to the Green Deal that was already mentioned before, we have to make nature part of the equation and of all actions. And that will require effective implementation of nature legislation, but also to shift the flows of public and private investment and financing to reward those that manage and protect our natural heritage for future generations. But that means also uh, that we need to develop new partnerships on conventional ones that turn this new approach into action 
action that comes with uh, new regenerative business models and uh, new ways in which we can integrate nature better in our policy and decision making processes. So um, Network Nature is a unique partnership uh, and also a resource for the nature-based solutions community that creates opportunities for cooperation uh, that will maximize impact and the spread of nature-based solutions. And as Bettina already mentioned, also to support the ongoing Horizon 2020 nature-based solutions projects in engaging with new communities and uh, to also promote and share the results and learning from all their actions. So in particular, Network Nature also uh, engages with new audiences, those that really have a major role to play in upscaling nature-based solutions, such as forest and landowners, water managers, the finance and infrastructure sector, but also the media, as Anna pointed out. Uh, it is about awareness and understanding how valuable nature is, uh, considering the challenges that we face today, uh, not only related to climate change, and um, if we can go to the next slide, I uh, listed here some of the key actions that Network Nature is taking. And uh, some of that was already mentioned before, uh, but what we aim to do is to bring together all the knowledge and evidence on nature-based solutions uh, from the academic world, but also from policy and practice in order to strengthen learning and access to all that valuable information that is there. And uh, we engage with the community of, of nature-based solution stakeholders in Europe, uh, strongly supported through the uh, Horizon Europe and Horizon 2020 programs of the Euro European Commission, uh, but also to expand that community by creating new partnerships and by identifying champions, those that lead the way in their fields and disciplines when it comes to investing and implementing uh, in nature-based solutions. Uh, so through the Network Nature platform, we share uh, on an ongoing basis the latest findings and knowledge and resources, as well as information about events uh, in this field. And we aim to accelerate the uptake of nature-based solutions across different aspects um, of, of policy, uh, but also practice. And um, we also have an important uh, aim, and that is to establish what we call European nature-based solutions regional hubs, but also national hubs, in which we will work together with the leading actors in the countries and regions uh, in Europe, but also internationally, to help them to uh, create synergies and to provide tailored support uh, in terms of their knowledge needs and uh, to make sure that they can spread uh, the use of nature-based solutions more widely within their countries uh, and also at local level. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, I've listed a few of the outcomes uh, of the IUCN World Conservation Congress, which took place last month in Marseille and uh, which is a, a important gathering for the IUCN community and all its partners uh, to drive the agenda for biodiversity conservation. And uh, when it comes to nature-based solutions, there have been a number of, of results and yeah, there's too many to mention them all, but I wanted to highlight a few that for us stand out and Daisy will also tell a bit more about IACN's actions uh, in follow-up to the Congress, but mainly this is about how we make nature part of the economic recovery from the pandemic and how we can drive new investments through nature, uh, creating these regenerative models, but also make sure that those investments in nature advance social justice and inclusion. And that, uh, of course, uh, concerns every part of the world and every sector of our economic life. Um, as we know, nature-based solutions provide uh, around 30% of the climate mitigation potential uh, that we need by 2030, also to help protect vulnerable communities. And to, uh, in order to do so, ICN encourages governments around the world to integrate nature in their commitments under the Paris Agreement in their nationally determined contributions, and to also apply the ICN global standard for nature-based solutions that Daisy will talk more about. Of course, in addition to governments, we also strongly promote the actions of non-state actors to include nature-based solutions in their commitments under the UNFCCC, uh, mobilizing climate finance while also supporting the objectives of our global post-2020 biodiversity agenda. And more on this will be uh, discussed as well in the parallel sessions this afternoon. So um, over to you, Daisy. Thank you, Chantal. And I'm starting my timer now to stay on point. 
So how many of you in the audience right now are feeling buoyed up, full of hope? Uh, people are working on nature-based solutions. We know the crises that we faced in terms of disaster risk reduction, climate change, food security, water security, uh, challenges in human health, uh, challenges in ecosystem degradation, or even just economic and social development challenges. We all know about those. And hopefully in this event, you'll see, you'll, you'll be buoyed up with that hope that people are working on it, that the EU is, is investing a huge amount of time, a huge amount of resources, into this and nature-based solutions are a component of that. Because we know, we know that nature-based solutions can offer immense potential when it comes to addressing the challenges that I just met. Um, we just heard from Chantal, they can offer about a third of climate mitigation needs to meet the Paris climate uh, goals. But they also currently, ecosystem services provide us with 170 billion US dollars in terms of global benefits. And that's looking only at ecosystem services related to nature-based solutions on climate. That's what's already happening. Nature-based solutions, you know, if we invest in them properly, if we find the strong examples, they could provide 1.4 billion people with clean and safe drinking water, at the same time saving 140 billion US dollars a year. So, I mean, we know who we're talking to in this call. We know that a lot of, uh, you know, we don't have anyone here who's, who hasn't heard the word nature-based solutions. Uh, you're interested perhaps in learning more or about finding out how to actually take action. Uh, you know how many of the SDGs that nature-based solutions can approach. But who here is perhaps losing hope? Who here is worried that perhaps we're not gonna reach our climate mitigation needs, that perhaps nature-based solutions fall at a risk of not being scaled up properly. Because for all the potential they offer, uh, next slide, there are some real risks and we're hearing that resistance from the community, especially in the run up to COP26. We know that if nature-based solutions are not applied properly with biodiversity at their heart, we won't be able to see that potential that they can offer for human well-being benefits. And we've uh, identified uh, two risks and uh, IUCN, an IUCN publication then offered a, a bit of a hint on how to address these. But we see that misident misidentification is weakening the evidence base on nature-based solutions. That's a possible thing. If we say that a monoculture forest is a nature-based solution, it might weaken that evidence base that we need to tap into that climate finance and nature finance worldwide. And of course, there's always, with any paradigm shift, with any new approach, there is the, the risk of misuse harming people and nature. And we really cannot afford to squander the potential that I just presented. So if you could just click, Susanna. The good news is, is that this uh, 2019 publication from IUCN really accurately identified, you know, what are the missing components? How do we both safeguard the terms and safeguard from these risks, but not just protect the term nature-based solutions, how do we also make sure that it's scaled up to really address that potential that they offer? And that includes action at scale. We absolutely need to move on from these pilots. Uh, many of you are part of those pilots that show excellent work. Now is the time to scale those up. We need to support nature-based solutions that go beyond that. We also need those interventions to be on the ground. Uh, we need to see, start realizing the benefits to people now. Also, we need that policy alignment. So it's not an, enough to just scale up action. It needs to be sustainable action through time. So there needs to be policy alignment, which is why we have that parallel session on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. But it's not just about that. Policy alignment goes from everything from regional, national, global, uh, even municipal in terms of that point. And we also absolutely need to bring in new sectors and technology because we might design a nature-based solution in a city, to address human health, but we know that every nature-based solution, when done properly, can can provide multiple things that uh, give them an edge, perhaps, on more traditional approaches. So, so for those of you that maybe have lost hope or are a bit worried about some of the, the resistance to nature-based solutions, here are some of the steps uh, where we can really realize that potential. But for those of you who really uh, appreciate a recipe or, well, how are we actually going to do that? Uh, what I'd like to present next is what IUCN identified as the real need in order to be able to scale up nature-based solutions. So we need a global language to bring in new sectors. 
We need a way to identify the strong pilots or the strong in actions to be able to scale them up, to replicate them across countries. And when it comes to policy, we need again that global language or a tool to be able to assess policy frameworks to identify, you know, where are the opportunities to bring nature-based solutions into um, forest policy or um, agriculture policy. And of course, many of you are working on different aspects of that. And that's what we see worldwide. We see great innovation in ecosystem-based adaptations. We see wonderful things happening. Recording in progress. Or peatlands. But what we really need here are standards to mainstream nature-based solutions. And IUCN in 2020 launched the IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions. And we've been working very closely with a multiple Horizon 2020 projects uh, on this standard to do just that, to design new nature-based solutions that are strong, that deliver, to verify what we already have so we can identify, you know, what are the stronger interventions, what are the partial interventions, and to scale up uh, or improve what we have. Uh, and finally, yes, scaling up those interventions, linking them to policy. So just to give you a sneak peek on the standard, because we really don't have much time, uh, the standard is a, is a booklet, but I wanted to give you our, the core of nature-based solutions, which start at societal challenges, because the standard is built around eight criteria. And we will be going into more detail in that, in the parallel session on what those eight criteria mean. But I wanted to leave you in the standard with these eight criteria are a way for you to communicate what nature-based solutions look like when they're done, uh, when they're done well, when they're done effectively. Those eight criteria from societal challenges to design at scale to biodiversity net gain can allow, and we've shown that, we have proof of concept of going to other sectors to do just that. So next slide. I'd like to leave you then with a bit more of that proof of concept. So watch this space because we've seen a huge investment, huge moment, momentum behind nature-based solutions. We've seen how the standard has catalyzed new partnerships and new policy linkages. So for example, we're developing a certification system in collaboration with uh, pre-existing schemes such as, as fair trade and FSC. Um, we are, the standard also links to the decade of ecosystem restoration, which is a part of what the, what IUCN is also part of, along with the UN and a, and a few other partners. Uh, so a key there is not, is using the standard to go address direct targets. So nature-based solutions, they sounded very theoretical in the five minutes I've had to present to you, but this is about addressing specific targets on the ground, especially in things like the UN decade of ecosystem restoration or the Bonn barometer. And what we'd love for you and then to take away from today's event is there are some very important COPs coming up. Uh, there's an absolutely fabulous EU policy currently also operating in terms of the EU Green Deal. So please do take what you've learned today, share with your colleagues uh, to look towards the post-2020 framework, COP26 in terms of climate, and of course, uh, the various components of the EU policy that you'll learn more about today. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, Chantal Van Ham, Daisy Hessenberger, absolutely amazing. If that didn't leave you fired up for the rest of the day, I don't know what will. Um, have you lost hope? Um, I was wondering how you were all responding to that question, whether you were nodding or shaking your heads at home. And now's a chance for you to interact with us. Um, we have a Mentimeter session um, coming up now, um, which you can join in and just tell us a little bit about yourselves, where you're joining us from and what you do. Uh, so we'll just wait for that to uh, come up on the screen. Here we go. So um, I'm sure many of you have used this before. This is new to me. Um, so do bear with me as I talk through it, but I'm sure it's very familiar to you guys. Uh, you just go to menti.com, pop in that code, 996288849, and you will be able to see some questions and provide us the answers really if, if you're not doing it do it we want you to do this uh because we want to know who's out there who's listening where you're from and uh, what stakeholder categories you represent um so hopefully you are all busy doing that um the information that it will ask for is which stakeholder category you're from as i said and if you're involved with any european nature-based solution projects and if yes, you will be asked to select your focus area and answer some questions. Uh, so just to give you, if you're still just
getting set up on that, the questions that we're really interested in hearing your thoughts on are how do nature based solutions contribute to restoration efforts? And this is a word cloud. So if you pop your words in that you think of when you hear that question, we'll get a sense of the most popular thoughts and feelings that are out there. Here we go. So this is the first question. We're already getting some information in. So most of you are from research and academia. That's very interesting. Business and nature based enterprise. That's great to hear that there is some private sector uh, representatives here today, civil society. But really, we are a, we are a, a big group of researchers and academics. So you're all much brainier than I am. Welcome, everybody. Business has gone up. So that's really interesting. I do a lot of these events where there are very few people from the private sector from business. So I'm really pleased to see that we do have representatives from that sector. Nine is coming up. Wow. OK, business people, keep coming. Great. I'm intrigued who the others are. There's five others. And we have representatives from um, cities and local authorities. So we have government people in, that's great, civil servants. Um, EU institutions are represented here as well. We don't have any investors or financing institutions. I wonder if that is a bit of a shame because if we do not finance nature-based solutions, um, we're going to have our hands behind our back. I'm also very disappointed, no landowners. You know, we uh, you know a third of the Earth's surface is, surface is farmed. Seventy percent of the UK, where I live, is farmed. You know, landowners are a huge, huge part of delivering on nature-based solutions. They really need to be part of the conversation. Um, similarly, infrastructure developers. Wow, researchers and academics. There's a lot of you. So that's really interesting. I wonder if we can move on to the next slide. Yet, do we have any more information? on the next section. Are you involved in one or more EU nature-based solutions projects? Oh, well, this is great, I love this. So most of you are, yep. Wow, so we have got a very well-informed audience with us today, you're all, working on something out there on the ground to deliver nature-based solutions in Europe. Fantastic. Thank you to you all for all the work that you're doing. But it's also really great that we have a good number of people who are not involved in projects. I think that's really important too, so that there's a real mix um, of people out there. So we've got 30, 39. Is this... If, you, if you're not involved in this, by the way, if you're just sitting back watching the results coming through and your smartphone is just there next to you, pick up that smartphone, get onto menti.com and join, this, join in with this because this is really valuable. We want, yes, you, you at home watching your computer screen and not doing anything, get your phone and join in. Fantastic. So the vast, vast majority of you are already involved in European MBS projects. It'd be so interesting to meet you and know what you're doing. I wonder if we can move on yet. Have we got any of the other slides available? This is going to be interesting. I can't wait to see what the majority will be here. What is your focus area? Wow. Okay, urban. Oh, we've got a real mix here. That is very interesting. I would not have called such a dominance for urban and peri-urban areas. That's probably just a bias from my background, though I tend to work in agricultural and um, conservation areas. So urban MBS is not my area of specialism, but I can tell it is your area of specialism. There are a lot of people delivering MBS in urban areas. Forests is also very well represented here. 
and great the agricultural and rural areas too. I see 15 from agricultural and rural areas. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on the fact that there are no landowners here or certainly no landowners that have taken part in the Mentimeter. Um, if you're working in agricultural and rural areas, I wonder what your experiences are um, working with landowners and how you can bring them into spaces like this. Um, marine, fresh water, it's great. We have got representatives from all of those sectors, which is great for today because that means all of our speakers will have relevance and will be speaking to people in our audience. But a very strong dominance for nature-based solutions in urban areas followed by forests, agriculture and rural areas third, and fresh water. Um, and mountain and alpine areas kind of level pegging with marine and coastal areas. And again, we have the mysterious other. Love to know what you guys are doing. Um, okay, if we're ready to move on, let's see what we've got coming up next. How do nature-based solutions contribute to restoration efforts? This is a word cloud. Uh, so I've never seen one of these before. I'm interested to see how what it will throw up um, so that we can get a real sense of when you think of that question, what words come to mind? Ecosystem services. Good governance. Oh, wow. biodiversity yeah this is amazing i i know you guys will have seen this a million times but i am loving this so biodiversity obviously is the biggest word is is obviously the main word that is coming from you guys when you think of nature-based solutions and how it contributes to restoration efforts i mean there's too many in there now for me to even read out but biodiversity is dominant at the center of that. So that just shows that without the biodiversity, um, there are, are no nature-based solutions. There is no eco ecosystem restoration. Um, ecosystem services still there. So it kind of shows you biodiversity. If you think of it as a pyramid, you know, the foundation being biodiversity upon which everything else here is built on that. So it really brings it home how that really is the building block upon which everything is built. Resilience, climate resilience. Thank you so much for your interaction. This is great. I really feel like I'm talking to you all. Um, shall we move on to the next slide? How do you foster ecosystem restoration and contribute to achieving biodiversity net gain? Wow, that's a big question. Have a go at answering that. I'm gonna have to wrap up a little bit sooner than, than I'd like. We are running a few minutes behind. Let's How do you foster ecosystem restoration and contribute to achieving biodiversity net gain? Interdisciplinary partnerships. That one really jumped out at me. Work with nature, not against it, which really is at the, the heart of what we're talking about today. Science-based approaches. C citizen science. That's really interesting, isn't it? We see a lot of citizen science in the UK with the big farm bird survey, the big butterfly count, all of these projects just bringing in the general public to contribute and really get involved. And I suppose that's how we will spread the, um, the profile of MBS. Deep stakeholder engagement, including more, more than human voices and agency. You can see that there is an extraordinary amount of experience and learning out there. I can see that all of this is coming direct from your experiences on the ground, which is great. Integrated interdisciplinary planning and implementation. Implementation seems to be coming up a lot. Yeah. 
hopefully this is giving you all ideas. Listen to and learn from those who live in the closest connection with nature. That's a very important one, isn't it? So often we develop our understanding of land from theory and science, which is absolutely essential, but also giving power and agency to those anecdotal experiences as well. If you've got a farmer that has seen 45 harvests or in their career, they will certainly have an idea of the pattern of flooding and so on and so forth on, on that land, awareness raising. Focusing on direct health and well-being benefits of nature. Very interesting. I'm checking my phone just to see how we're getting on for time. Yep, shall we move on to the next question? Oh, this one's a really interesting, really important question. What do you consider the most important barrier for restoring ecosystems at scale? So when you think of, when you think of a barrier, what immediately comes to mind? Share your thoughts now, people. And, and from your experiences as well, ignorance, lack of money. Yep. Ignorance, I suppose, might tap into what I said at the beginning of this event when we were talking about um, there just simply not being the awareness out there yet of what you guys are doing. Valuing ecosystems. That's very sad. It's something that you would think would be innate, um, but it sounds like some of you have encountered a lack of value for what life on Earth depends on. Lack of awareness. Political support. So we've got political support, ignorance, development, and lack of money coming out as dominant. And um, lots of a lack of trade-offs. It's important, siloed thinking. I just picked up on that. I think that is absolutely spot on. There is so much of that, which holds us back in so many ways. Urbanization, consumerism. Consumerism is a very good one. Thank you for that. Anthropocentric thinking. Gosh, that's over my head a little bit. Economic interests, political support. So that is, um, that's quite moving, quite sad that that single word ignorance is really jumping out from this slide. It was really there. And um, let's hope that we can tackle that in the work that we're doing today. Because I think conversations like we're having today, if there's one thing we can change, it's ignorance. We can turn that into awareness. Um, I'm just going to check in if we are ready to move on to our next speaker or whether we want this slide to stay up a little bit longer. Susanna, just send me a message if you're ready to move on. Yes, <laughs> excellent. Thank you everybody for taking part in that Mentimeter session. I, I found it fascinating. I hope you did too. Um, so, Let's move on. So if we are going to embrace nature based solutions and make a success of it, we need to understand exactly what we're dealing with. And that's about funding the right research, which can, which can fill those knowledge gaps which may exist. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Frédéric uh, Lemat. I know I've said that terribly. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> I tried my best. Um, from uh, Biodiversa, which promotes research on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, Frederic is an expert at juggling the interface between science, society and policy. And he's going to give us an overview of where nature based solutions, research and innovation is heading in Europe. Should be really exciting. Thank you, Frederic. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, and uh, we're very happy to uh, to be presenting this work of uh, Network Nature today. So, um, one of uh, the activities that will be streamlined through uh, through the, the three years of uh, um, Network Nature and possibly beyond is uh, the development of a European uh, roadmap for research and innovation on NBS. And um, we are starting with this uh, with this work um, uh, now, and. Um, I wanted to uh, show you today, so for the first time, preliminary results from uh, different pieces of work we're putting in place to, to build a bit the, um, the base on which we would uh, um, uh, derive uh, uh, overall themes and uh, contents for, uh, for the roadmap. 
So um, these are two uh, key elements. On the one hand, uh, we looked at the landscape of what's been going on in terms of NBS. Uh, and uh, we looked specifically at EU uh, research uh, projects uh, that have been funded in the past. And uh, we wanted to look also at uh, existing identification of knowledge gaps uh, in the literature, but also through bottom-up processes, which I'll be both aspects presenting a bit more in detail now. Next slide, please. So you can see here uh, our overall uh, thinking for developing uh, our initial objective, which is a draft uh, version of this uh, roadmap uh, to be uh, delivered in uh, January 2022. What we've done, as I mentioned, is first have uh, from the left hand side to the right uh, a mapping of European NBS research and innovation projects, looking at uh, what uh, kind of uh, projects these are, environment, social challenges, and these kinds of information. Then we uh, conducted a, a desk study of uh, key literature uh, highlighting uh, explicitly knowledge gaps on uh, NBS. And we are combining this with an uh, online consultation, so a more bottom-up process uh, for uh, um, people uh, to submit uh, knowledge gaps in relation to uh, nature-based solutions. And finally, um, one other key input in the development of this roadmap will be the session uh, we are holding this afternoon around uh, the identification of uh, barriers and uh, levers for research and innovation to uh, promote the deployment of NBS. So I will first focus on the mapping aspect. Next slide, please. Um, as mentioned, so these are uh, research and innovation uh, projects, EU research and innovation projects we've looked at from uh, the programs you can see here. These include Biodiversa, FP7, Horizon 2020, Interreg, and we are in the, pro in the process of integrating uh, also uh, LIFE. And what we did is look at uh, the entirety of projects funded by uh, these programs and uh, using a keyword uh, method, uh, we uh, identified those which relate to uh, biodiversity and then services and approaches, uh, so ecosystem services and uh, approaches. Um, and we uh, then uh, checked projects manually against a set of criteria to identify those which are explicitly uh, NBS. And so you can see from about 61,000 uh, projects, uh, so that's for uh, the, the, the whole uh, projects funded under all these programs, um, we actually uh, fall down to uh, 223, not including life uh, yet, uh, which are uh, explicitly and uh, clearly addressing the different aspects of NBS. And when I say this, of course, we refer to uh, the definition of the European Commission and uh, IUCN of uh, NBS. Okay, next slide, please. So to, to see a bit uh, what this... Um, this uh, looks like. Uh, so we've looked at, for instance, the number of uh, projects uh, funded over the years by this program. So you can see there's the reaching a bit of a uh, critical mass since uh, 2017 onwards to have an idea in terms of funding. It represents above, since 2017, above uh, 100 million euro uh, in funding, uh, still a rolling three-year uh, average, uh, this figure. Um, next slide, please. And uh, we looked, as I mentioned, also at uh, social challenges, and uh, we we heard about uh, okay, um, um, different uh, definitions of NBS and um, and uh, typologies. And we wanted to show you here also. It's maybe a bit technical, but we wanted to highlight how in this study we tried to articulate uh, existing uh, typology, and uh, mainly the two ones we use are from uh, the European Commission and uh, IUCN to derive um, categories that you see on the right-hand side, which we'll be looking at. And a uh, brief mention for the bottom one, biodiversity enhancement. This is something we've considered across all projects. So uh, according to the definition of NBS, we used uh, um, if, uh, if a project is uh, not addressing uh, biodiversity enhancement, it's uh, hardly uh, considered a, a nature-based uh, solution in our work. Um, and so what does it look like in terms of uh, results? Uh, next slide, please. You can see um, here the, the, 
the key uh, societal challenges that come out. So the first one uh, that strikes out uh, is uh, around uh, social justice and social cohesion, new economic opportunities and green jobs and participatory planning and, uh, and governance, uh, especially on uh, the majority of projects. <coughs> Uh, the, the majority of projects in there are uh, really about um, economic opportunities and, uh, and the green jobs. Uh, if you're wondering between the three uh, more or less aspects there are in here, which one uh, comes out most. And then we have um, more uh, thematic aspects that strike out. So for climate resilience, uh, food security, and you can see uh, then uh, the others that come out. And interestingly also, there are a number of these which come out as non-specific, uh, uh, just seeing across uh, societal challenges uh, across. Okay, next slide, please. Um, here we uh, we uh, you can see a bit also the types of environments. So it relates a bit to the menti session also we had a bit before in terms of uh, uh, environment. So you, you you can see um, a high proportion of uh, projects, of course, address uh, urban environments, which is a uh, um, maybe not a surprise. Interestingly, also we included in our work uh, agricultural uh, NBS. Behind this, we mean um, um, agroecology approaches and uh, landscape, uh, agricultural landscape uh, management uh, practices. And it's quite interesting to see that uh, agricultural land uh, strikes out quite strongly also uh, for the NBS aspect. And maybe one other uh, comment um, is uh, related to uh, coastal and uh, marine uh, projects. Actually, if you look at um, the projects that have been funded over the years that relate to NBS, and it's an important point. It's that that um, explicitly say there are NBS or uh, which we found relate to NBS uh, based on the methodology uh, used and the definitions used. So it means it's uh, maybe uh, uh, also projects that don't explicitly present themselves as, as NBS. And so you can see uh, there's uh, quite a fair proportion also in these types of environments. Next slide, please. Um, to uh, focus so on the second aspect, more looking at the knowledge gaps, uh, we will be publishing a, a report uh, in November uh, based on the findings I'm showing uh, today. And uh, I can already uh, show a few uh, preview of uh, results uh, related to the collection of knowledge gaps. So next slide, please. To give you uh, a profile of uh, what we've looked at, so uh, we've used uh, 17 uh, key publications from gray, li gray literature and uh, scientific papers. Um, we uh, identified collected gaps when they were clearly stated as such, and overall, uh, it's uh, uh, a bit over 100 um, gaps collected in this publication, and which we were able to organize in 39 categories with uh, more or less uh, 10 to 15, which uh, come out recurrently uh, in different publications. Next slide, uh, please. So to give you a bit of a profile of these death study results, you can see on the left-hand side uh, what uh, broad types of gaps these uh, correspond to, uh, research gaps, uh, data uh, gaps explicitly, which I think maybe is uh, you know intertwined with the research aspects, of course, and uh, knowledge implementation gaps for a bit over uh, a quarter. And uh, you can see here uh, we compiled um, a draft uh, word cloud about the, the keywords that come out in, uh, in these categories. Um, and so you can see a bit here what it looks like, uh, performance, sign-based assessments, synergies and trade-offs come out st strongly. Um, categories which uh, strike a lot are around cost-effectiveness and performance of NBS, synergies and trade-offs uh, between different goals and impacts, and also uh, between uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. And also there's a strong call for more uh, evidence and, um, and study of long-term effects of NBS in terms of performance, profitability, ES delivery, and also uh, resilience. Interestingly, also, so we see um, topics that come out related to climate change, also to comparisons with the uh, gray infrastructures and uh, the integration with gray infrastructures, so what are called uh, hybrid, um, hybrid uh, solutions. And uh, there are a number of other topics also which show up uh, quite strongly related to uh, the development of indicators, to the engagement of stakeholders in the co-design and co-implementation of NBS, um, the need for standardization of methods, etc., and also questions related to inclusive governance and environmental justice. 
Okay, next slide, please, to give you uh, now a, a short overview of uh, what the survey uh, results looked like. So we had 45 respondents over a month. Uh, this was open in, uh, in September. Um, and uh, it's about one half academics, one third stakeholders, including national policymakers, NGOs, and SMEs, uh, so small and medium enterprises. Uh, mostly, and we had uh, overall 46 uh, gaps uh, collected uh, this way. Next slide, please. What does it look like? So you can see here, uh, in terms of types of gaps submitted, we have a, a, a fairly similar proportion on the, in terms of research and uh, data, and, uh, and an important, uh, uh, a bigger proportion of a knowledge implementation gap, uh, which was the objective also uh, of, um, of um, this uh, survey to get more bottom-up feedbacks and from uh, um, uh, other aspects than those that can be uh, collected, you know, um, research and innovation uh, policy uh, publications or research publications around knowledge gaps. And, and um, it was also a way to uh, to see, we compared with the results of our desk study, uh, which is the bottom graph. You can see, uh, so there's a, a fair share, which was already explicitly addressed in the desk study uh, compared to the results we had in the survey and uh, uh, a share which was not explicitly addressed. And you can see the type of things that came out. We tried to synthesize here imperfectly, but still uh, relating to missing knowledge and data. And so uh, context specific synergies and trade-offs between ecosystem services, the role of biodiversity in uh, ecosystem services provision, but also questions around uh, um, financing and uh, sustainability, uh, for instance, or environmental justice and social cohesion. We had uh, things related to implementation gaps, so um, in terms of operational knowledge uh, at local and landscape scale, uh, also transposition of NBS and legislative frameworks. And uh, we had also other aspects come up um related to uh capacity building or awareness gaps so related to the appropriation of nbs at national and local policy scales or uh, awareness of nbs uh in terms of uh, what this is huh? i think this was touched upon already this morning and uh linking this to acceptability of solutions by uh, citizens okay uh, next slide please so to summarize, we, we have these different elements we're putting in place. We have the session this afternoon where uh, we're really excited to hear uh, your views on, on this work and also uh, in absolute terms of what you think are, you know, the, the, the main levers and, uh, and uh, barriers uh, for uh, uh, support from research innovation to uh, the deployment of NBS. Um, and we will be using all these elements to feed first into a strategic session with uh, research and innovation uh, programmers and experts uh, from uh, the European level, which we are planning um, to uh, define a bit the contours of uh, this uh, first draft of the roadmap, as mentioned, and this afternoon will feed uh, also um, in there. And uh, uh, the idea is to have a first draft for January 2022 that would undergo uh, public uh, consultation and scrutiny, scrutiny, sorry, um, and um, and would undergo also a new uh, co-creation uh, exercises and uh, discussions like the one we will have this afternoon. Uh, to arrive uh, to a final version of this roadmap expected in May 2023. Okay, so uh, that's uh, it for me. I, think, I hope you, you enjoyed uh, seeing these first few results. As mentioned, there will be a publication in November from Network Nature, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, a few of you also this afternoon in our session to talk about this more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frédéric. That's brilliant. Um, so we move on to the second half of this morning's session uh, with our panel. Um, this is a chance for you to hear from people working on the ground to deliver nature-based solutions. And they will be sharing their experiences and they are here to answer your questions. So please do put your questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, all the questions will appeal there, but we also have a team of people working behind the scenes who are going to forward the questions to me via WhatsApp. Uh, it's a little easier for me to read them off the phone rather than scrolling through the Q&A. So forgive me for looking at my phone. I'm, I'm not being rude. I am looking at your questions. Um, so let's introduce the panel one by one. Um, I'll introduce them and then I'm going to ask each to give a short opening statement um, and I will be timing it and to our panelists if you do go over three minutes I will start gently making 
coughs and noises to get you to wrap up um, in the nicest possible way. Um, first up, we have Tom Wild. Uh, Tom is an ecologist and a specialist in river restoration and sustainable urban water management. He's based at the University of Sheffield in the UK and works for the Connexus project, which is all about getting cities in Europe and Latin America collaborating and working together to demonstrate how nature-based solutions can reverse the harmful effects of urbanisation. Tom, could you give us your opening statement, please? You have three minutes. Thank you, Anna, and greetings all from a cold, crisp and beautifully autumnal Sheffield this morning. Um, I'm Tom Wilde from the University of Sheffield's Department of Landscape Architecture. And as Anna said, I'm an ecologist by background, specialising in aquatic ecosystems and environmental planning. It's my privilege and pleasure to be leading the Horizon 2020 Connexus project. Connexus is a 6 million euro research and innovation action running from 2020 to 2024. And we have over 30 partners in Latin America and Europe, including cities, NGOs, enterprises, and some of the world's leading researchers on nature-based solutions. Connexus aims to co-produce, structure, and promote access to the shared contextualized knowledge needed to support cities and communities to co-create nature-based solutions. Together, we plan to restore urban ecosystems and to help drive the required step change in urban policy and practice in European and Latin American countries. Our focal cities of Sao Paulo, Bogota, Santiago, Buenos Aires, Lisbon, Barcelona and Torino share common challenges of sustainable urbanization. And we're united by our experience and our transdisciplinary approach and our vision to implement context appropriate MBS within a mindset of nature-based thinking. In the project, we're working with MBS at a range of scales from macro level planning through meso level connections in green infrastructure networks, down to micro level pilots and demonstrated, demonstrators co-created with citizens in local communities. Connexus uses these demonstrators productively to work at the interface between research, policy and practice, seeking to move more quickly and confidently through this cycle of research supporting evidence-based policy, leading to improved practices, and in turn, providing new opportunities for research and innovation. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to, again, thank Network Nature and the facilitators and organizers for this excellent conference. I'm really looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. That's fantastic. You even had more time. Thank you very much, Tom. Fantastic. Um, next up, we have Pierre Fayi. He is a professor of economics at Portsmouth University and an expert in development and ecological economics. Um, his specialism is the blue economy. Um, so how we continue to use oceans and coastlines for economic growth while preserving ecosystems. And he coordinates the uh, Maco Bios project. I'm sorry, Pierre, if I've, I've said that wrong, um, but it's a fascinating project, which is searching for ways to help European marine and coastal habitats cope with climate change. Such important work. Pierre, welcome. Can we have your opening gambit, please? Yeah, thank you. And uh, so, yeah, so I will give you just a brief overview of what we are doing. So we have this uh, very, very nice Macrobios project, which is a project really dedicated um, to look at the nexus biodiversity ecosystem services and climate change. So this is what we are looking at um, in a deep way. We have about 17 partners across Europe and in the Caribbean working on this. We have a common, we can say, uh, we, we have a link um, we have something that link all the case studies, which is the seagrasses. So why we have seagrasses is because seagrasses is between mangroves and coral reef. And usually people look at reef, they look at mangrove, but they forgot the seagrasses. And we realized um, many years ago when we were working for the French um, initiative on coral reef that one of the most important ecosystem in terms of value was, was the seagrasses because he absorb carbon, he store carbon, he protects, I mean, he, he, he decrease the, the, um, the waves energy. So he protect the coast. He has a necessary functions. He has a lot of, he provide a lot of ecosystem that both reefs and mangrove don't do. 
So this is why we are working on seagrasses, both in the Mediterranean area, in the Caribbean, and also in the North, North Sea. And at, in addition to this, we have other ecosystems that we look at, and of course, we are working on, on, the, on, the, on the reef ecosystem in, in the Caribbean, mainly in Barbados and in Martinique, and all the people are doing some good, some field work at the moment, so all my people are in the Caribbean at the moment. I'm the only one in my office in the UK, in Portsmouth, but uh, that's, that's life. Um, so, uh, so, and the, the other uh, important ecosystem that we are looking at is the kelp forest in the north uh, of Europe. So that's the important thing. So this is what, what we look at. What we want to really to, to achieve is really to show that depending on the options we have in terms of policy, in terms of implementation, in terms of regulations, we will not provide, we will not end up with the same level of services that this ecosystem can provide. As I, I was mentioning for the carbon sequestration, for the coastal protection and for other services. So this is really what we are looking at. So we are building scenarios for this, just to look at about what's happen if we do this, what's happen if we don't do that in terms of policy in action. And we show that for instance, for Martinique, we have a loss of about 2 million euros every year due to the policy in action for the protection of the uh, um, coastal ecosystems. So this is the type of things that we want to, to end up with is really to provide some solutions uh, for policymakers in order to provide, um, to, to, to have some sound policy implemented. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have Holger Robrecht, uh, Deputy Regional Director at ICLEI. Welcome, Holger. Uh, he has spent 30 years working towards creating climate resilient, carbon neutral um, cities. ICLEI, that's Local Governments for Sustainability, is supporting projects in two and a half thousand cities towns and regional areas worldwide. It's kind of a, a local meets global network, making the voices of regional communities heard globally. Welcome, Holger, and um, please take the floor. Thank you so much, Anna, and uh, good morning to uh, all colleagues and friends uh, that are here in, in, in the uh, participants. Uh, I shall send you regards from Malmo, where I have been in the last two days uh, for the European Urban Resilience Forum, which had a clear focus on nature-based solutions and green infrastructure, and Network Nature was one of the partnering uh, projects uh, to that forum. Um, let me say from a city's point of view or local government point of view, the question of upscale opportunities for upscaling nature-based solution is a little bit peculiar. Of course, uh, we don't have a clear definition in this very moment for what urban ecosystems would be. However, we do have a focus on urban and peri-urban areas. So there is a little bit of a mismatch. And there is definitely and certainly an interest in cities uh, to better understand and better uptake. Um, what we see in the Horizon Europe uh, project so far uh, uh, is that urban ecosystem have been more indirectly addressed. For example, in the 2016 and uh, 2017 round, there was a focus on climate and water resilience. We will hear uh, uh, Marcus Collier later on for Connecting Nature talking about it, hopefully. Uh, and in 2017, 18, we had focus on urban regeneration. So in that urban regeneration, there is actually a greater opportunity uh, for also addressing uh, urban ecosystems. Of course, we don't restore urban ecosystems, we create urban ecosystems, and this is where nature-based solutions come very strongly in, and we have many driving forces, many challenges, and many uh, good reasons to do so, including climate change, the pandemic, but also urban uh, envir uh, environmental health issues. So the focus, and let me uh, remark that from uh, the word cloud that we have seen, the focus so far in research innovation, this is a barrier, not an opportunity, honestly, and please researchers take that serious. Uh, there is a focus currently um, still on using cities uh, as sort of cases, as research objects. And this is a case study syndrome that we see long time in research and innovation projects. So the understanding for upscaling, outscaling, replication, the needs of cities is still limited because cities not necessarily 
are partners in project. Uh, I would like to refer to the word cloud that was very, very interesting. We see barriers for restoration at scale, ignorance, nature blindness, disconnect from nature, human centrism, and even colonialism, neocolonialism mindset. What I haven't seen is infrastructure. There is no single reference in that word cloud, but this is the technical and planning dimension in cities. Can we employ decision-making for interventions and financing? We need to speak the terminology of decision-makers, planners, technicians in cities. We need to understand that green infrastructure needs to be positioned as critical infrastructure and asset for cities. So uh, in a couple of projects uh, in the Horizon Europe, we have um, some perspectives on that where cities play a role for outscaling and upscaling both inside their territories both, uh, and also in their regions. They play a role in that and they have plans to deliver, for example, in the projects Clever Cities and Pro GIREC. Uh, but also there is a number of opportunities for cities engaging in global activities and the urban by nature program featured by connecting nature is actually a bridge to that to connect to south america korea uh, korea china uh, the eu neighboring countries and the western balkans more to come uh, when it comes to network nature and you see that i have the logo in my back here uh, there is a general hint that network nature so far had not included um, cities uh, as an immediate actor uh, but more indirectly uh, worked with the target audience natural resource managers landowners infrastructure develop, uh, developers planners and others uh, I believe that this is because the requirement list uh, in the call was not immediately addressing cities that is hopefully to come in the next iteration of that platform project. But in any so case, gently hurry you, Holger. Sorry, I have to gently hurry you if, if you would. Okay. mind. I will talk about network nature then when you ask me further on, but it will offer a number of opportunities for for building hubs and bridges for cities. Let me close by one sentence, and that is the framework conditions. That is very, very important uh, for creating opportunities with cities. And Anna, you mentioned the financing sector is not here, but uh, uh, and, uh, under the umbrella of the Green Deal, uh, there is now many, many things happening. And uh, in the last two days, we had uh, four speakers from European Investment Bank and EBRD in the European Urban Resilience Forum, and they were speaking nature-based solutions in the framework of infrastructure investments. And here you go, this is exactly the bridge. Final uh, standard standardization is very important, and it was mentioned by IUCN, but let me tell you that um, standardization needs also to include the business sector, and this goes into the ISO, Senselec, and ETSI level, and also the national um, uh, standardization bodies and we have wonderful opportunities to bridge to that community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holger. And you've provided the perfect bridge to our next panelist uh, from the business community. Um, welcome, Julia Carboni. Um, um, so Julia is director of the Natural Climate Solutions Alliance at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's a global organization led by the CEOs of 200 businesses from Microsoft to MasterCard, Bloomberg to BMW, whose combined revenues amount to eight and a half billion US dollars and has a workforce of 19 million employees so a serious force and um over to you julia um for your opening statement welcome thank you very much anna and uh, thank you all for inviting me i'm also standing for well there are a number of colleagues of mine that i actually work on other aspects of nature-based solutions and not just the natural climate alliance um but so it's, i'm here to kind of bring you an overview of from the business perspective of what we do um but the the opening statement, I think, is I just wanted to uh, not really talk about so much about what we do, because I think I will have more of an opportunity when you ask me additional questions, but more about the perspective from business. Um, and actually, this also addresses one question that Holger had. Where is the investment? Well, the investment can come from business. The question is, um, what, does, what does an MBS mean for a business, right? So if you look at the definition, 
the NBS definition, and I'm using the IUCN as I'm a former IUCN <laughs> person, is that actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural ecosystems. The question from a business perspective is, what, and that, sorry, and that, that will address societal challenges. From a business perspective, we have to turn around this definition and say, what are the problems that I have as a business that can be then resolved through a an, an MBS, you know, a nature-based solution, therefore an action that will, you know, conserve, restore, sustainably manage. And this is a really important point because that will then define how you can actually integrate this in your business model. So personally, I am the director of the Alliance and where we are looking at nature-based solutions for climate mitigation, right? This Alliance brings a lot of businesses at the table because the, NDS for climate mitigation will address one of the business issues. So it is, we have a problem, climate mitigation, how can we address it? Right now, there are two main ways, you know, carbon capture, technological, or nature. And nature will provide a much better solution because it's not just about the carbon mitigation, but will have a lot of co-benefits. Companies are ready to invest because it makes business sense. So the, that's what I'm saying provocatively, when we start talking with business and want to have those, you know, the investment from business, we need to be able to transform the NDS into business solutions. So climate is the obvious one, but there are others, other, other ones as well, like, you know, for example, disaster, disaster risk reduction, you know, coastal defense. These are really also very valuable. When I say valuable, I mean, dollar-wise valuable for businesses that actually have, for example, assets on the coast. I'm thinking about the tourism industry. For example, at the IUCN Congress, we had a lot of extremely interesting example from the tourism business that actually owns hotel assets on the coast. And instead of investing in, you know, in gray infrastructure, they start investing into natural, nature-based solutions. Um, agriculture is another very obvious one, but I think the importance is to turn around the question and say, what do you need as a business that can be resolved with a nature-based solutions? And, and then, then obviously the standard has to kick in because it's not just about green, but has to be a nature-based solution, therefore has to abide for the same standard, you know, the same principles that are incorporated in, in, the, in the IUCN MBA standards, because these will apply anyway, because the solution is the same solution is just the perspective changes. So with that, I look forward to have discussions with all of you later about, you know, what does it mean for carbon, which is clearly a very controversial issue, but what could be the amazing, you know, the incredible benefits in terms of restoration and conservation of nature that um, NBS for climate could bring. Thank you, Anna. Julia, thank you. Fantastic. Um, and last, by by no means least, we have Tony Williams, who's been waiting ever so patiently uh, from the International Federation of Landscape Architects. Welcome, Tony. Uh, they're mm -hmm. the people who design our parks, housing estates, city centres, motorways. And Tony is a past president of IFLA Europe and is now chair of the Working Group on Climate Change with a particular interest in nature-based solutions and blue-green infrastructure. That's the natural and semi-natural aspects of our environment environments, our ponds, parks, trees, bushes, watercourses, woodlands, um, all in good hands with Tony. O <laughs> over to you, Tony. Well, we have a lot to live up to. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Anna. Yes. Um, as landscape architects, I suppose, um, it's, it's good to be in this discussion because it, it is what we do. Um, we look to nature, essentially, in, in, in looking for answers. Um, and we have found ourselves in a lot of predicaments lately. Um, I'm from a very sunny Dublin, as you can see, and um, even in the east coast of, of Ireland, we've actually getting very dry springs. But I suppose in terms of an overall statement in a few minutes is we definitely feel that the role of landscape architects and landscape architecture is in adaption, adaptation and mitigation of the effects of climate change. How these changes to climate may impact our landscapes, our seascapes and our skyscapes, because we can, we can look to all of these uh, parts of our vision, what we can see happening, and it's in our face, climate change is happening. So when we experience these persistent effects, um, the impacts, the effects on urban, rural, um, we have to respond. So 
as landscape architects, we use techniques, we use methods, and we try to have a holistic view that can be harnessed in tandem, of course, with other professions to anticipate the effects, to design, plan, construct, monitor. That's part of what we have to do. And we have to do that at landscape scale, but we also have to do it at a local scale. And that's the difficulty. Um, so how do we scale things up? Um, I went back to science. I started in science. I went to landscape architecture. I'm back in science because I think we need to bring knowledge to people. So we need to observe what's happening in the landscape. And then we need to look to nature as to how we might fix that. What would nature do in that, in that situation? I work on infrastructure. I had to put other in the, you know, the, the, the pole, but I actually work on infrastructure. So, um, but I also work in an academic sphere because what I'm trying to do is bring the scientific and engineering uh, knowledge to contractors. And in the chat, I've put in some of the links we have. I work with, with Connecting Nature here in Trinity. I also work with Transport Infrastructure Ireland. So we build things and we provide, um, the, the know-how to our contractors. So there's no excuse. So build the motorway, put in the slope that way, make it uh, car as low in carbon as you can and make it as biodiverse as you can. And that's in the contract. That will happen. So it's our job then to oversee it. So it's implementation is the secret in my, in my view and getting civil society behind us in that because when they see the outcomes, uh, which are more humanized infrastructure, we hope, and more um, nature friendly, if that's the, the term to use. Um, so finally, I suppose as, as landscape architects, we're communicators. We have to communicate that um, to everyone, including our clients. Um, yeah, that's probably about three minutes, is it? That was brilliant. Thank you very much, Tony. Very interesting. And um, yeah, when I think of some of the, the new roads and service stations that have been built in, in my area in the southwest of England, mm. I have noticed they are greener. Yeah, um, well, so, no, we, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, I put a, a link in the chat. We worked with Arabs and Kyria, Syria, um, with, also with um, uh, our colleagues in the UK. And, and they're very much, um, I suppose, ahead of the game in a way because... Um, a lot of the southeast of England as well. Um, I know of some colleagues who are working on projects there and rewilding using natural seed, using natural seed stock. That's all becoming very much part of it. And then we have the pollinator strategy here in Ireland, which again is saying, let nature do the job. Don't throw the seed everywhere. What you do is you say, let an, let an area renaturalize. But to engineer that, you have to do it so that in the interim, the slope isn't going to fail. So we have to build resilient infrastructure, but we also have to do that over a period of time. And it's the time element that is the, the, the bit that the bankers don't like. And I, I'm sorry to say it that way, but you know, if we present all of the risks when we build infrastructure and we say we include nature, it costs this much, it costs this much less to maintain over the life of the infrastructure, then actually we're making a good commercial case as well as a good natural case. The two yeah, have making, to go together. Making the business case. Yes, yeah, you I, have to make a business case, unfortunately, always. I, I buy my coffee now from a service station that has a green roof. So that's- a, I make that's my a own. <laughs> I don't grow it, but I make my own. I'm just really mean. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we're just gonna, we're ha gonna have a good discussion now, ask you all some questions, get some chat going. Um, to those of you watching, please send in your questions. We, you know, there, there is no such thing as a stupid question. We want to hear what's on your mind. So please pop it into the, uh, the chat. Uh, I'd like to go to Tom first, Tom Wild. Um, just been hearing about the need to make a business case and cities and urban communities need evidence of the long-term viability before investing in nature-based solutions. Can you give us a practical real-world example of how the Connexus project has provided such evidence? Yeah, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> I think it's important to look at this in the global context and locally from a city standpoint, particularly reflecting on Holger's point in relation to funding and to indicators of co-benefit. So while there's good news in the Protected Planet report, the government's achieved targets to protect 17% of land and water ecosystems, they are also failing to keep pace with climate impacts, particularly in urban areas. 
and reflecting on the nature-based economy white paper and the UN State of Finance uh, for Nature report, I anticipate that most folks will welcome the call for a tenfold increase in private sector investment by 2030, but whether that's accompanied by wide support for cit from citizens for the 190 billions worth of public sector funding for nature remains to be seen. So equally importantly, there's critical gaps which aren't being filled. So the Green, Green Purposes Company and Finance Earth report from this year identified 1.5 billion US dollars investment in MBS, but hardly any of this related to urban interventions. Um, and the WRI, WRI report, uh, the World Resources Institute, uh, this year highlights the, the gap very clearly in relation to MBS for climate adaptation. It, it paints a, a stark picture of donors' inability to effectively apply climate finance to investments, also of countries and cities' inabilities to integrate MBS into adaptation strategies, and it talks about MDB's inability to develop and prioritise funding programmes. So I think at the heart of this challenge is the need for a much deeper understanding of how we make business cases for investment to restore nature, particularly in cities. And clearly that the way that MBS deliver multiple functions is critical to how they can outperform conventional grey infrastructure on economic as well as socio-ecological grounds. There's really clear evidence for that in our state of, the, uh, state of the art report for the EC published last year. But I don't think it's convincing to try to cram hundreds of co-benefits into assessments as attested by the lukewarm reception of the Global Value of Ecosystem Services work in the late 90s. That would leave MBS and their proponents open to accusations that they're simply jack of all trades and masters of none. And many of the economic assessments of MBS aren't sufficiently robust or commensurate with embedded calculative practices, accounting, in other words. And I think we, we need a much more nuanced impact assessment approach that is attuned to local context, just like a good MBS is itself. Um, in Connects is the key to getting MBS fully integrated into urban plans is to co-develop the indicator frameworks with those cities. And this talks to Holger's point, Getting much closer to the city priorities also gives us a greater chance of maintaining buy-in buy beyond political cycles and election timescales. That's an area where Connexus is making really good progress through the work of Sander van der Jagt, Arjen Buis, Cinnamon Dobbs, Stefan Paola and others. And we're piloting a participatory assessment framework through which we co-develop the indicators and outcome measures together with the cities themselves. And that provides a much firmer platform for robust valuations, economic assessments, as well as genuinely grounded business cases for future investments into MBS. Thank you very much, Tom. Just very quickly before I move on, um, I know that we have a lot of people that have worked on urban and peri-urban MBS projects here today. And um, what, why is there this barrier when it comes to urban and, and city adaptate, adoption of MBS. Can you just very quickly explain to me what those barriers are? Yeah, so focusing in laser point on the valuation and economic assessment aspects, which I've been working on now for nearly 20 years. Um, I believe that's largely due to the fragmentation, the complexity of urban land ownership and management uh, as compared with rural areas. It's so much easier put to put together a natural capital assessment for a big land holding. And, and we need a much more detailed understanding, a much more nuanced, fine-grained approach that really understands how different landholders, different managers, uh, different stakeholders come together um, and how those different aspects can pull together in, in a plan. I, th I think you're better asking Holger about this because they, they really speak to the city issues very clearly. Well, Holger, over to you. Would you like to pick up on that point? Well, I think uh, uh, Tom is, Tom is uh, definitely right uh, in, in his analysis here, uh, but uh, I would like to reiterate what I said before. Uh, I think that the big point is we need to, to make um, nature-based solutions, and it's part of the, uh, the, part of the challenge is the wording itself, uh, really uh, like an infrastructure, a critical infrastructure in cities. We have seen it in the pandemic, 
um, that uh, it is so important uh, for giving sort of a quality of life to, to citizens to feature uh, urban uh, environmental health uh, and really to, to support also uh, social cohesion in the, in, or coherence in that sense that people can go somewhere without having an effort to do and, and money to invest and all that. So I think this is very, very important to understand. For, uh, for policymakers, and I can really also refer from the last few days in, in Malmö, uh, everyone is talking and hinting and pointing at the potential of green infrastructure and nature-based solutions. Let's give them these solutions at hand, but uh, this is really sort of an, uh, um, a collaboration partnership between us, networks, the researchers, the business people, uh, definitely, and the investors. Uh, there is a, a great opportunity. The understanding is growing. There is a policy framework in the EU with the EU adaptation strategy, the EU biodiversity strategy, the Green Deal, you will find nature-based solutions everywhere. It's pointing always in the same direction. But when you go in the recovery package, you will find in most of the national uh, um, recovery plans uh, only hints to climate mitigation. There is E, uh, uh, e infrastructure, for example, electronic infrastructure and e mobility, but we don't look at the power of nature. The investment in, uh, in nature is not uh, has not arrived in the understanding of our political leaders at national level. Is not the local level. Is the national level that currently is not understanding what power we have in our hands uh, to uh, rethink re uh, and re green our cities. This is where we can actually uh, uh, have uh, really a difference uh, to make and this is us okay thank you very much and um it, it's chiming with that word that came out dominant in the word cloud isn't it ignorance and um what you you've just said that i so you, you, you said level. it's not chime <laughs> yeah uh, you said it's not chiming at a national level with governments um julia i'd like to ask um if it's chiming with business leaders so how in your world, when you talk to people in your in, in business circles, how many would recognize NBS as an acronym or would know immediately what a nature based solution is if you were talking to a CEO or somebody in, in a boardroom of a big international corporation? Well, Anna, the problem is always that we kind of tend to stay, stick to our community. And so those I talk to, they know it very well. The question is, how do we go beyond our first level? So I think definitely from the World Business Council, um, I hope the plan is also to use the, you know, use the, the WBCSD members to really capture the knowledge, understand how it works. Um, understand the business case and so on, and then use that knowledge to go beyond the group of 200 companies, which is great. You I mean you gave great numbers, um, but the, the economy is much bigger than that. And the economy, and they're the business players that we need to reach out, are also the medium and small companies to for them to understand what is their role to play, how they can create coalition. Uh, how they can work in associations, for example, to have, you know, to use MBS at scale, because that's one of the criteria to really have a proper MBS and not little pocket of, you know, little restoration, which is a big issue, especially in the climate, you know, how do we go beyond the, the, yeah, the small projects? Um, but so I think education, education, education is still a priority for also for business. In, the, in our alliance, we have a group of companies that understand very well what is uh, an MBS for climate. They also understand the challenges of using it, So that, but that's a separate question. But we also have clearly the challenge of how do we promote, and therefore, how do we raise awareness and educate other businesses that don't really understand it? I mean, in the complexity there is not just understanding NBS, but also understanding NBS in the context of climate mitigation, which I tell you, it's really complex. I'm new to the subject. So I was like, that really takes, well, definitely a PhD, but we have to make it simple. And that's also because businesses have other business to do. We want them to adopt this and go for it. And therefore adopt the meaning invest in NBS. Um, so we have to educate them. So I was, you know, I think research programs like what it was presented earlier are really important also for business. So I was planning to connect later to understand also from a, you know, try to really get also boost from a business 
perspective. What are the needs and what kind of knowledge and how can we package this knowledge in a way that is you know, easy to absorb and easy for a decision making for a business from a large to a much smaller one. Thank you, Julia. I'm going to come back to you on, on those challenges shortly. Um, I'd like to go to Pierre. Um, Pierre, almost half the European population lives in marine coastal regions and climate change puts these areas, puts these communities at risk. Um, what has your project discovered that can improve their climate resilience? And I'm looking for something quite, quite specific here. Have you, what, what, uh, what have you discovered in a nutshell? Uh, the old classic, you're on mute. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Yeah, thanks for the question. Well, up to now, we didn't discover too much but uh, within the project, but we have a long experience working on the uh, nature-based solution, restoration, and things like that. And to give you uh, um, an example, um, not from the European Union point of view, but from the UK point of view now, um, so we, we have been working in the southern area for many years, for more than 20 years, uh, uh, working on the restoration on the seabed. So using oysters as a key indicator of the quality of the water. So we are we, we have uh, restoring the oyster seabed. It was one of the oldest in the UK. Okay, and uh, so very old oyster bed in the, in the UK. So that, and it was completely extincted. Um, about 20, almost 20, 25 years ago. And now it's, it's getting better and better, thanks to the restoration that has been done. Okay, within the microbios, we are continuing to look at this. Uh, we are also looking at the whole ecosystem from a whole ecosystem perspective. So as oyster, as an indicator, but also to restore the seagrasses. And, uh, and that's, uh, I think, um, end up with some good results. Can so I ask you, um, could you spell out for me some of those practical restoration methods? How, how do you restore an oyster bed and a seagrass area? Well, yeah, I think you need to have two things. And, and I think this is the and this is what we have done also in, in, in Martinique, is that you need first to do some um, replanting or, you know, re restoring it by putting, you know, some little oysters or, uh, or seagrasses, you know, back into, into nature. So you, you need to have a nursery. So that's the first thing. But on the other side, and I think this is something important is that there is no way to do restoration is there is no move on the other side. I mean, from the quality of the water that is coming. Okay. Like in the salon, and I give you, I can give you the example of Martinique because I think it's a better example for this. Uh, about ten years ago, you know, uh, there's a beach nearby for the France, the capital, where the, nobody was going swimming okay, because the water was not good at all. We are just a band of a, a, a group, a small group of swimmers. They were going there. So we did the, this big study for the French uh, IFRECOR initiative, the French initiative for the coral reef. We have been able to show that there is a very high value you know, of all the coastal ecosystem for tourism, for everything. The, the region of Martinique decided you know, to do a very big, uh, and they made a big effort to, to clean the water that is going to the sea. And now uh, this beach, there's a full of, it's full of families. Uh, and when you swim, you have seagrasses, seagrasses is back, uh, they are back. You have turtles. So you see at least five or six turtles every day, every time you go swimming. So just in 10 years time, you can see you know, a big changes in the environment. So that's practical. But in the macrobios, we are more supplying the scientific side. I think one of one of the very important things, and I think this is linked to what Julia was saying, is that at the moment we are in the in the, in a period where MBS is tend to be associated uh, with, especially with carbon carbon sequestration and, and and climate mitigation, where we will tend to select the best species, for instance, for carbon sequestration or the best species for coastal protections which are not necessarily the best on the long term. We saw that with the forest when we try to restore the forest. And this is something that we are doing, for instance, in the Bahamas with the implementation of the blue economy in Bahamas. You know? So with the, the two big islands on the north, Great Abaco and Grand Bahamas that have been destroyed in September 2019. Yeah. And this is where you know, everybody is looking at, especially the insurance company. 
I think the insurance company play a key role at the moment in this MBS uh, scheme. Thank you very, very much, uh, Pierre. Um, Julia, yeah. I have a question for you, but did you want to pick up on, on what Pierre said there? Yeah, I mean, the point is that it, what is critical, and this is where I think the IUCN MBS standard is very important, is that, um, and also what Daisy was saying, is that, you know, you have an objective, let's say climate mitigation, but if you want to call it an MBS, it has to deliver on everything else. It can't just be, you know, I plant trees because that's my address, the climate. But if, we, and here, at least our alliance is talking about MBS. It's not about, you know, planting trees is about actions that actually will have co-benefit. And, and it's challenging because right now, that, I mean, I see there is a lot of standards out there, a lot of pressure to demonstrate on the carbon side of it, and maybe a little bit less on the biodiversity side or people side. And that's, as a new director on the NCS Alliance, it will be my job to really raise that bar and say, we call it NCS, that is an MBS for climate, Therefore, we have to demonstrate also the biodiversity aspects. And that means maybe not all the projects will make it in our, in our world. We have just launched um, a demand campaign. So basically a way to promote the fact that there is going to be a demand for high quality natural climate solutions, because we figured that in order to trigger the supply of high quality natural climate solution, it is important to signal that there is a demand. And we have really put forward um, very stringent eligibility criteria from the perspective of what is the journey of the company in terms of mitigation, because we want to make sure that, you know, we fit well also with the whole narrative about the, the credits, the use of credits has to come after the whole journey towards net zero, but also very stringent in terms of what kind of credits are we going to count, you know, count into this demand, and they have to be high quality. We have put standards out there, you have to demonstrate that they actually have biodiversity benefit, but there is a lot of more work to do in terms of raising that bar in making sure that it's what does it mean to be to have a net positive impact on biodiversity, which is one of the key principles of the IUCN standard. Thank you. Yeah. And, and it's getting away from that siloed thinking that we heard about in, in the word cloud. And yeah. You know, it's not a pot of climate change over here and a pot of biodiversity over there. Absolutely. All Absolutely. The and that's yeah. exactly the beauty of the NBS because. It's not about anymore about people thinking about carbon, people thinking about biodiversity, but is we need to talk about this element together. So is in the in my example is carbon and biodiversity, but is also about uh, you know food and biodiversity is about health and biodiversity. They can come together, but not just you know it's not just a different narrative. It it has a different way of doing, it, and therefore we have to be strict in what we consider an MBS and what is just not. Yeah, it's a, it's a different narrative and a different mindset. Yeah. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, Tony. Um, so Tony, we're saying that more and more landscape architects are integrating nature into their plans and designs, mm -hmm. but is it mainstream yet? Uh, if not, I mean, so when, when you talk to colleagues and things, do they, how many of them share your view? And if not many, how do we make nature-based solutions the mainstream in landscape planning. Yeah, I suppose I suppose as landscape architects, they all share it. It depends on the project, really, in terms of how they can respond. Um, one of the things we've done is um, at if the global level is we've, and I'll put the link in the chat, is uh, we launched the uh, climate change action plan in 2019. And then we're asking each national association of landscape architects to sign up to that. And what that does is it creates a kind of a common ground where we can say, well, these are the, the kinds of outcomes that we want from our designs and constructions and our operation, if that's the right word, of the infrastructure we build or the landscapes that we design or manage or maintain. And, and that's a really good starting point. So that's one thing we do. And I think the other is that because we work with other professions so closely, like planners, uh, rural planners, urban planners, and uh, architects, you know, traditional architects, engineers. It has to be a rounded discussion. And we try and bring nature-based solutions into that because um, it is a resilient way to build. 
it's a very um, cost efficient way to build. For instance, we redesigned our tree pits in an urban area. We reduce the cost, but they're just as effective to, if we have the area. And I think by doing things that are a little bit innovative, we have to keep pushing. Then we have to, when we're building, to have nature at our fingertips because it is a very good designer. The best designs are nature. Um, so we have to kind of learn from that. And I think Holger and, and a few of the others have said it. Uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Pierre there at the last bit, that you need a nursery. You need to approach it as a horticulture. You need to have that kind of nursery view. The stewardship behind it needs to be from citizens. So citizens need to get behind it. Uh, I think citizen science can be very powerful. And then as landscape architects, we really have to respond to our clients and our clients may be local government or they may be private. But I think if there's a body of knowledge behind it and a, a construction, uh, for me, as someone who builds things, if we can provide the know-how and the knowledge to build these things resiliently and we know what the costs are, then it's very clear at the outset of a project how nature can be included. Because what very often happens is as the project is developed, if nature isn't brought in early, and I know that sounds funny, then it's kind of excluded later on because it's an add-on. And I think it's really important we have that view throughout the concept and design phase, not just at the end. Yes, so it's it, really it's, important. Yeah, yeah, not an afterthought. It's not like, an afterthought. A pre. Oh, crikey, we forgot the nature bit. Quick, yeah, oops. shove it in at the end. Yeah, yeah. that's the one. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's not the thing to do. I have yeah. got some questions coming in from our audience, and the first one is really interesting. Actually, it kind of it sticks with that theme of mainstream thinking and how we overcome ignorance. Um, what are the best strategies to mainstream MBS beyond? privileged bubbles um, such as this group and thank you for pointing that out whoever has asked this question it's it's a really important one I think someone touched earlier about how do we stop preaching to the choir and get out of the echo chamber um, and uh, yeah how do we get into local decision decision making um, done at municipal administrations trained in grey infrastructure ignorance has very deep roots who who feels passionately about this and would like to take this question about breaking out of privileged bubbles? Um, does anyone? Tom, go for it. Yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely the big question that we need to take forward in, in terms of ecosystem restoration decade as well. Um, and I think the Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe programmes work on nature-based solutions has been very insightful in putting co-creation at the heart of that. Um, working with citizens and um, I think there's, there's a related part which is also around uh, double counting of nature-based solutions which I'll come to later on but um, uh, in terms of the the kind of uh, citizen participation I, I have to mention I'm sorry the Brexit word as well having seen and been involved in European projects for so many years and we were calling for um, a deeper participation of citizens in things like Interreg and ERDF and so on, and being be facing the barrier of this horrible phrase of a natural person. I can't think of anything worse um, than, than, than the exclusion of a natural person from these projects. Now, this is a particular rule, which is basically you have to be an organization or some kind of registered group to, be, to become directly involved. And it's a massive barrier. And, and the way that the programs and the projects have addressed this is to try to deeply involve citizens in the design, in the management, the maintenance, what, what I term placekeeping, um, as well as placemaking. And uh, I, th I think we are making progress with that. I think we will see the results a long way down the road. And the, the real test of it will be whether, uh, whether people can directly benefit from that in terms of income, in terms of services, in terms of skills, in terms of project coordination activities. And I think that's where we'll see the, the biggest step change. Thank you very much, Tom. So giving people agency in these projects. Uh, Holger, have you, did you have a point to make on this question? Yeah, uh, very much so. Um, I think there, there are a couple of uh, uh, aspects that we could potentially influence. 
the first of which is definitely skilling and reskilling of people. So the whole education uh, um, of and training of engineers, planners, and uh, I think that there is a whole lot of things going on currently, but still we see in office mostly people that have been trained uh, in previous uh, eras and that obviously uh, was favoring gray infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So here I believe that universities will have a, a role to play in edu higher education uh, and, and uh, really training people to understand in their office, in their 40 years of office in a public space, they should really introduce uh, like a balance between the gray and the green. Um, the second, I believe, is um, the procurement. Um, we should understand that there is uh, 1.5 trillion euro per year in Europe spent in public money uh, for procurement. And uh, this obviously can go here and there. What currently we have uh, is basically an, a cost argument, no, the price argument, but we don't have sort of a, um, a social return on investment or a nature return on investment currently embedded uh, in the procurement idea. So we need to go into sort of changing the criteria. And when we then launch contracts uh, in, in, in public governments, no, we can obviously make a difference, but it also needs to include an understanding that the warranty in the contract is not for the moment it, it uh, is sort of completed. The completion is after 10 years or 15 years, I believe Tony will better uh, be better equipped to explain why we need to have a long-term perspective also in uh, understanding what actually a successful implementation of such a contract is. Uh, and then my final point uh, on this is going back actually to the sanitization. It was in the in this uh, in the chat also a couple of times. Um, uh, there is this opportunity to introducing standards which procurement will refer to. I mean, it's an, an immediate link, right? Uh, and here uh, is uh, my invitation. Actually, I'm the chair of the uh, Sen uh, Technical Committee, Sustainable C Cities and Communities. Wrap up, Holger. We've got to keep. Almost, if you could wrap up, that'd be great. I will do that, it's one sentence. My invitation, go, go, go. My invitation is we have a priority in our work program on nature-based solutions in the context of sustainable urban development. And in December, I invite everyone to our plenary and uh, present the strength of nature-based solutions in standardization. We will have it on our agenda. You are invited. Okay. Oh, everyone is invited. Fantastic, thank you very much. Can you pop a link for that into the chat? Holger. Happy to do so. Great. Um, so I can see Julia and Pierre, I can see you've got your hands up, but the next question is linked and perhaps you could incorporate it um, into, into what you want to say, because we know that we have a lot of academics and researchers attending today's event. And uh, one of them has asked, what is their role as individuals in getting out of these privileged bubbles? What can they do? And in terms of education, what are the challenges and barriers related to higher education on nature-based solutions? So maybe, um, uh, Julia, if we if go to you first and then to Pierre. So uh, I think nature-based solution, because I mean, we are just using that term now, but it means it's, it's so vast in terms of the type of interventions and therefore research is definitely absolutely a must because we also, there are a lot of um, complexities as we were saying about what does it mean in terms of benefits? How do you actually implement? Uh, so research is absolutely welcome, but also research, local research, adapted to the local context. And in my answer to the bubble is that, for example, I think that it will depend what is your challenge. So um, right now we are talking about Europe and I hear a lot about cities. Yes, so it is very bubble in, in Europe. But if we are looking at uh, where the solutions are being found for the climate mitigation demand, so let's say businesses have a demand, but they're not the one implementing the solutions. They're just paying for the solution, right? That's the whole point. The, the solutions are delivered by organizations on the ground and they are in the South. There are plenty of opportunities there. And therefore the question is also, okay, you have the big organizations, the project the developers, but also we need to you know, develop education programs for project, small project developers that can create coalition and have the capacity to deliver this proper NBS that will benefit local people, local biodiversity and the global climate. So 
the, you know, we really need this infrastructure also to take place because we can't just rely on the big project developers, which are great. They're, you know, they're doing well, they are good standards, but we need to build the capacity. So the education is not just the corporates, but it's also the local communities to, to see themselves as project providers, to have assets. You know, we are talking about NBS, but a lot of it is from the climate perspective was, how do I value my forest for an econo ecosystem service that it provides? So the famous payment for ecosystem services we used to work on 10 years ago, now they are available. You know, people are willing to pay for them, but we need to create that capacity to go out of the bubble. So and that's my... Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Pierre, over to you. And, and maybe you could pick up that point that was asked by a researcher as, as an academic yourself, um, you know, what kind of barriers you have faced and how as researchers uh, we can help to take this out of the bubble. Yeah, th yeah thank you, Anna. Yeah, I think, the, I think we have a key role to play and this is what we're trying to do, especially when we are visiting colleagues in, in other countries. That So the, the idea is to give at least uh, one, provide at least one intervention in their, in their lectures, in their course, you know, just to sensibilize students about uh, climate change, biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't cost anything, uh, but it's very, I think it's very good for the, for the student, especially in the Southern countries. When you, when you go there, you just give a lecture. So that, that's a very simple things. The things we, we, we try to, we have done as well at the, in the university, and this is something that we will do in the near future. We have done that with cosmology, uh, reaching about 5,000 kids in the Hampshire. Uh, not only in choosing one, one year, but following the same cohort for many years. And that provides a lot of good results. And this is something that we want to do. We said, uh, if we get uh, a big NERC project, so we will get, we'll get the answer next week. So uh, we want to do the same with the MBS and the everything around the, the, the connection between nature and the health of the people. So this is what we want to do. But I think one, one thing that has to be done, and this is crucial, and I see this here and I see that everywhere in the economic department of finance or business department, there's nothing on climate change and biodiversity. So the, the, the student, me, I teach development economics. So I give some awareness to the student on this, but there's nothing to so the business people people, the finance people, uh, that they, they, they are not aware of the aware of this. So this is this should be included in the curriculum of the business uh, schools and things like this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Pierre. Um, a final question to Julia, and then I have a very quick question for all of you that is a one word answer. Um, Julia, uh, we've had a question from the audience about, um, is there more of a discussion that nature conservation could be an essential part of corporate responsibility and and if not i was wondering if um if you had to make your elevator pitch to somebody in the business community and uh, kind of really sell what a nature big based solution could do for a business but you only had like 20 seconds and mm -hmm. and why it should be part of their corporate <laughs> responsibility because we know these are fast people who don't have time yeah. how would you how would you get it across so in consider that I'm doing it for a business. So I might, you know, a business looks at opportunity. So I will say it's an opportunity to address two problems at the same time. Wow, Tony's giving that a thumbs up. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then they'd be like, what two problems? And then you've caught them. Fantastic. Well done. And um, a question for all of you. Um, I was really, when Daisy Hessenberger said earlier and she put out that call to the audience and said, have you lost hope? Um, I was wondering which of you were nodding and which of you were shaking your head. So which of you have lost hope? None of you. You all have hope. That is great. So when, when Daisy asked that question, you were kind of like, no, I haven't lost hope. Um, does any, um, so just one minute before I'm going to wrap up. Pierre, good. You have a thought on hope. That would be a great note to end yes. on. Yes. Well, yeah, the... Um... I think uh, the university was closed for a long time and I had some plants in my room and uh, two of them were more than 30 years old, okay? And uh, they, uh, it's happened that the, my colleagues was able to uh, rescue one and they put them in the corridor and now they call it oak. So, and everybody is taking care of the plant. Fantastic. So, 
that's a good sign. That is a good sign. And I thank you, Pierre, for your anecdotes in this panel. It has been fantastic to hear stories from the ground. It really brings these things to life. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to check my WhatsApp just to make sure that there isn't any burning thing that I've forgotten to, to ask any of you, but, and uh, just check that I'm okay to go into the wrap up and the sum up. Um, send me a signal on WhatsApp, colleagues. They are typing. Yes, let's finish. Thank you very much to our panel. It has been, I have found it absolutely fascinating and illuminating talking to all of you and um, we really could talk all day. Um, I'm just going to go just to sum up what we've heard today and also look ahead to this afternoon because it ain't over yet. There is still so much to do today. Um, first of all, thank you, Tom, Pierre, Holger, Julia and Tony for distilling years of experience and expertise into just 60 minutes and um, you know it, it really is a skill to be able to do that um, and there has been a lot to take in over the last two hours but considering where we started questioning how much awareness there is out there about nature-based solutions hopefully we have showcased some of the people and projects who are really putting NPS on the map and thrusting ecosystem restoration into the spotlight, uh, which is absolutely where we need to be heading. And the moment that made me sit up uh, was when Daisy asked earlier if we had lost hope. And um, you know, we know that our panel hasn't, and I haven't, because of something she said next. She said, people are working on it. And then when I chaired that Mentimeter session, and I could see all of that interaction coming from you, our audience interacting with us, I could see you, I could see your expertise, your passion sort of spilling out of that session. And that gave me hope because I, I don't have the expertise to do what you, you were all doing, but as a, as a citizen, as an ordinary person, it made me feel more hopeful that, that there are good people working on this with big brains and that's what we need. Um, it did make me sad that the word ignorance came out as your biggest barrier to restoring ecosystems at scale. And, um, and as a farmer's daughter, it also saddened me that there were no land owners among our audience today. Um, and we will have a representative from the European Landowners Organization later on. So it'd be really interesting to hear his thoughts on that. Um, but the other word that came out very strong in the Mentimeter session was resilience. And, um, you know, it, and th th that is a wonderful way to, that is what, nature-based solutions will contribute is resilience in our ecosystems and in our environment. So, um, and then also we talked about the need to create awareness. So if you start off with ignorance, then you create awareness. And if we end up with resilience, that's quite a journey that nature-based solutions can take us on. Um, our next job is to drill down into some of the details where you can break off into your specific areas of interest and learn so much more and, um, and engage with our, our panelists and our, in the breakout sessions. So after lunch at 2 p.m. Central European time or 1 p.m. if you're in the UK like me, um, there will be five parallel sessions, each lasting two hours. Um, so to help you pick and choose, you already will have received a link, um, but here's an introduction to what's happening this afternoon. So the first session is called Rethinking Cities, from smart into human. And this has been um, organized by the European Investment Bank, EBI Institute, uh, the University of Luxembourg and Caritas, the Catholic charitable organization to explore how we're going to create more resilient, there's that word again, resilient uh, and inclusive communities and cities by looking at the built environment. Um, the next session, carbon farming as a nature-based solution and paying for ecosystem services. Uh, this is organized by the European Landowners Organization. I know there's a few of you that are working on agricultural MBS projects, so we'll certainly be of interest to you. This session will look at innovative approaches in sustainable agriculture with an emphasis on engaging landowners and farmers in MBS, really important. How does this marry up with the European Green Deal and other relevant EU policies that, and funding instruments? So if you enjoy a bit of cap chat, that's the one for you. Um, in session three, this one's hosted by IUCN. Um, this is the role of nature-based solutions in delivering the post-2020 biodiversity framework. Daisy Hessenberger touched on that earlier. Um, how can NBS scale up actions which provide biodiversity benefits 
as well as improving human well-being and addressing societal challenges can we have it all is basically the question it will be asking um, experts will look at linkages and complementary frameworks such as such as the eu biodiversity strategy stakeholders from different sectors are encouraged to join as reversing biodiversity loss will require the buy-in inspiration and investment from diverse actors so definitely not just one for the choir that one is about breaking out of the privilege bubbles that we've talked about and they're keen to attract diverse and even dissenting voices um, the fourth session closing the research gaps for nature-based solutions so we heard about this from frederick earlier organized by Net uh, network nature and uh, biodiversa uh, this session is all about getting you to, to participate in the ongoing development of an eu research and innovation roadmap on mbs um, you'll be invited to discuss how network nature is gathering knowledge on mbs and where those gaps are what potential pathways could move us forward and the final one which is really interesting uh, a kickoff meeting on the net um, of the network of national representatives for small and medium enterprises interested in mbs so we've heard from the world of big business during our panel session this session aims to kick off and discuss the scope of a european wide network of national representatives to support SMEs and startups who are interested in MBS uh, within Network Nature. So what are those business opportunities? Uh, Julia has really got us thinking about that uh, related to MBS and how can we support those through capacity building, networking, matchmaking and financing and funding advice. And the network will also generate policy recommendations to better inform policy makers. So whether you've chosen which one you're going to attend or not, you should, you should have already received an email with the joining information, but the team are going to pop the links into the chat now as a reminder, just in case the email has sort of sunk to the bottom of your inbox and you can't find it. Um, we are finishing just on time, thank goodness. Well, 10 minutes late, but that was okay. And <laughs> there's always a 10 minute buffer, it's fine. Um, in the meantime, uh, take a break for your brains and your stomachs. Have a lovely lunch and we will see you back here in two hours. Bye for now and thank you very much everybody for a fantastic morning.